Welcome back everyone to another reaction video as we dive into part two of Epic History TV's look at the Apollo program, the space program that put man on the moon for the first time in 1969. I believe that's the part we're on today, judging by the episode's title, which definitely comes from Neil Armstrong's quote. Uh, by the way, misquoted, but we'll get to that. So uh, if you did not see the first part of this, my reaction, uh, the link is in the description of part one, as well as the link to the original content so you can check it out without my commentary. Highly recommend Epic History TV. They do a fantastic job with presenting the history that they cover, and they cover a lot of different things. They've got World War I stuff. They've got the Apollo program. They've got things from ancient times. Napoleon, of course. We did their whole series on Napoleon. A lot of great stuff out there. Let's go ahead and dive in. The Apollo program had been rocked by the tragic death of Apollo 1 astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee. But it had recovered with the brilliant success of Apollo 7, the first crude test of the command and service module. And in 1968, after seven years of intense research and development, NASA had flown three astronauts 240,000 miles from home and into lunar orbit. That is such an amazing feat to me that I, I just have a hard time getting over it uh, that that we made the leap we did. And I talked about that yesterday. And just because of so many things that could go wrong and you're basically using computing power that's less than what's in my phone today uh, to do all of this. And you've got these, just a testimony to the number of brilliant men and women. Uh, by the way, if you have not seen the film on the women who helped make NASA uh, a success in going to the moon. You definitely need to check out Hidden Figures, fantastic movie. Apollo 8 flew within 69 miles of the moon's surface, but crossing that final gap would be the greatest challenge of the Apollo program. It would require a completely new and untested type of spacecraft, the lunar module. It's amazing to me that the the most delicate part of this mission, right, the the potentially where something could really go wrong and the men could be stuck there and there'd be nothing they'd be able to do about it, that they haven't even actually developed it yet, <laughs> and they're less than a year away from landing. Hmm. In the wake of Apollo 8's daring journey to the moon, Apollo 9 received much less public attention. The mission wasn't even going to leave Earth orbit. But within the astronaut corps, the first crewed flight of the lunar module was seen as an even more exciting challenge. The mission's commander, Jim McDivitt, had actually turned down the chance to fly to the moon on Apollo 8, choosing Apollo 9 instead. Like many Apollo astronauts, he was a former test pilot, and this was a chance to test a brand new flying machine. So one of the things that you'll notice, and I'm sure there was a reason for this, most of these astronauts are right in that like 35 to 45 year old range. They're not real young guys, they're guys with experience, especially flight experience and military experience. A lot of these guys have been veterans of like the Korean War and have been combat aviators during the war. Uh, so there's definitely, you can see that there's a very particular type of individual that they were looking for. Two, one, zero, liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before the test flight of the lunar module could begin, the crew had a challenging docking maneuver to perform. The lunar module was folded inside the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket needed to be extracted using the command and service module. Roger Houston, uh, we're about 25 feet now on the closing point. Oh, that's just a way hard back. Good show. Leaving command module pilot Dave Scott to fly the CSM, McDivitt and lunar module pilot Rusty Schweikert climbed aboard and undocked. The lunar module was the first true spaceship designed only to fly in the vacuum of space. 
Its insect-like body was designed without the constraints of aerodynamics. And those little things you see hanging down, those were what was going to tell them when they were almost at the surface, right? As soon as one of those dangling things touched the moon's surface, that's when they would get their light that would come on that said contact within. And that's when they'd shut off their engines and go ahead and set it down on the ground. But every panel, bolt and button had to be as light as possible so the craft could lift itself off the moon's surface. Because remember, what did we talk about yesterday? We talked about how um, most of the fuel that was in that giant Saturn V rocket was just to get off the ground and get it going into space and break from uh, Earth's gravity. Now, the moon has gravity. It's only one-sixth of the Earth's gravity, which means, you know, so if you weigh 180 pounds on Earth, you weigh 30 pounds on the moon, which is why those guys can jump so high and things like that. But there is still gravity. So you still have to have some thrust to get off the surface, but you can't fit a lot of fuel into that thing. So you've got to you know, make it as light as possible so it's as easy as possible to get back up. But Divot said that it looked like cellophane and tin foil put together with scotch tape and staples. <laughs> That'll give you a lot of confidence, right? <laughs> he gave his craft the call sign Spider. Unlike the command module, Spider did not have a heat shield so it would burn up if it tried to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So, if the astronauts couldn't re-dock with the command module after their test flight, they would have no way of returning home. Yep. But Spider's test flight went perfectly. McDivitt and Schweikert flew the lunar module over a hundred miles from the command module. They tested the ascent and descent engines and returned for a safe rendezvous. Dang. See, and again, we just take this stuff for granted that they just went up there and did this, but this stuff had never been done before. It had never been tested in space. There were a million things that could have gone wrong. I know I keep saying that, but I, we, we need to understand the stakes here and what the consequences were if anything went wrong. The lunar module was ready to fly to the moon. The dress rehearsal. And, I, you know, I always really felt... I guess I shouldn't say I feel bad because I know this is what their mission was and they understood that. But these guys, man, they were like almost on the moon and then flew back up. Like their job was to do everything but actually touch down on the surface. NASA had successfully tested both the command module and lunar module and made a trip around the moon. Many hoped the next mission would attempt the first moon landing. But NASA needed more experience in communications and tracking two separate spacecraft in lunar orbit. Plus the challenges of rendezvous and docking in the Moon's weaker gravity. And there was another critical unknown. In 1968, NASA scientists discovered that the Moon has a highly uneven gravitational field. Hmm. This is caused by huge lumps of high-density material in its crust known as mass concentrations, or mascons, which could exert an uneven pull on a spacecraft wow. and throw it off course. Geez, just the, the things like that that they had to consider. And again, it just goes to show you how incredibly intelligent the men and women were that were working on this, that even things like uneven gravitational pulls because of things under the surface of the moon were taken into consideration. Before it was safe to attempt a landing, NASA would need to learn more about the mascons by examining their effect on another Apollo flight. Apollo 10 would be a dress rehearsal for the first landing attempt, flying every part of the mission except for the final descent to the surface. The Apollo 10 crew was Commander Tom Stafford, Command Module Pilot John Young, and Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan. And I may be wrong about this. I know Gene Cernan was on Apollo 17, which was the last one that landed on the moon. He may have been the last guy to walk on the moon. All three men were veterans of the Gemini program, and with five missions between them, they were the most experienced crew ever sent into space. So there again, I, I said this earlier, but look at the ages. All three men were... So all three, this is a U.S. Naval Academy graduate. He's a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, which is kind of interesting. He went to the Naval Academy, but ended up in the Air Force. 38 years old. Uh, U.S. Navy commander. 38 years old. And then Gene Cernan, 
U.S. Navy commander, 35 years sent old. Sent into space. Stafford and Cernan flew the lunar module to within nine miles of the moon's surface. Their successful flight proved every phase of the mission, except for the final descent. Hmm. Now, everything was in place. It was time to attempt the landing. Apollo 11 would be commanded by Neil Armstrong, a brilliant engineer and test pilot. From Ohio, baby. Look, and, and this is the second straight mission. You've got at least one guy from Purdue University, which is kind of cool. And by the way, I share a birthday with Neil Armstrong, which is kind of awesome as well. Uh, and he actually he actually lived here in Northeast. Uh, he lived in Warren, which is where I was born. Um, and we have a uh, there's a little like monument there with one of the lunar like a model of one of the lunar uh, landers, um, where he took his very first flight in an airplane. Uh, here when he grew up in this area. But then he ended up in Wapakoneta, which is down further south from here. Early in his NASA career, he'd flown the experimental X-15 rocket plane, up to an altitude of 207,000 feet, at speeds of almost 4,000 miles per hour. When he joined the space program as part of NASA's second astronaut group, he was one of the few astronauts to be offered a command on his first mission. It tells you a lot about the man, but Neil Armstrong was also very reserved, very humble, very quiet. He was like comparing him to someone like John Glenn, who's another Ohio, very famous Ohio astronaut. Um, John Glenn, I don't want to say he was like he wasn't like arrogant or anything like that, but he was very confident, very outspoken, much more of like the rock star personality, right? Where Neil Armstrong was very humble, reserved, quiet, just kind of went about his job. But the fact that they made him a command pilot on his first mission is impressive. Gemini 8. Gemini 8 achieved the first docking of two spacecraft in orbit. But the mission almost ended in disaster when a faulty maneuvering thruster caused the Gemini capsule to spin wildly. Mm. Armstrong's calm and swift piloting brought the spacecraft under control. And although the mission was cut short, he'd proved his almost superhuman ability to remain calm under pressure. It's what you need on a moon mission. Joining him as lunar module pilot was Buzz Aldrin. A graduate of MIT, Aldrin wrote his doctoral thesis on piloting techniques for orbital rendezvous. Oh, he's a doctorate. So he was Dr. Buzz Aldrin when he landed on the moon. I didn't know that. Uh, Buzz Aldrin's still with us. He's still alive. The only surviving member of this crew. In fact, one of the only surviving men who's walked on the moon. He's in his 90s now. In great shape. Uh, again, a very outspoken guy. Uh, and he's going to very famously, well, I'll get to that when they land on the moon. And had an extraordinary understanding of orbital mechanics. He'd proven his expertise on Gemini 12. When the spacecraft's rendezvous radar malfunctioned, he was able to compute the orbital maneuvers himself and guide the capsule to a successful docking with an unmanned target rocket. So what we've got here is two guys who are gonna land on the moon who have demonstrated in space their ability to problem solve, to think critically, and to do that in a very highly uh, stressful situation. Those are the guys you want on the moon. The command module pilot was Michael Collins. He would remain aboard the command module whilst Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the moon. A lot of uh, US military graduates on here and uh, Michael Collins, I believe his, his father was, uh, I need to look this up because he had some pretty critical role in World War I if I remember right. Yeah, so here's his father. Uh, James Lawton Collins was a major general in the U.S. Army, served in World War I and World War II. He had a brother who was a brigadier general um, who served as Army Chief of Staff during the Korean War. Or no, I'm sorry. Um, his uncle was a four-star general. His, his brother was a brigadier general. Um, but yeah, the, the father, if I remember right, there you go. He was an aide to General Pershing. So there he is right there. And now I remember why I knew that, because at one point I did a video on a picture that was supposed to be very famously a picture of uh, General Patton with General Col uh, Pershing from World War I. And it's actually Pershing, and it might even be this photo here, um, from in, oh, it's from Mexico. 
uh, and there was a lot of people that were claiming it was Patton, and I, and it, I found out it was Collins in that photo. He had no regrets about his assignment, telling reporters that he was going 99.9% .9 of the way there, and that was fine with him. <laughs> Saying the right things. But years later, he would recount his greatest fear, that Armstrong and Aldrin would be stranded on the surface, leaving him to travel back to Earth alone. Mm. And as I said yesterday, that was something that was planned for, and there was a speech that was prepared for President Nixon to give in the event that happened. The 15th of July, 1969. Almost a million people were gathering at Cape Kennedy to watch the three astronauts fly to the moon. I've been asked by people over the years, what's the one event you wish you were alive to witness? It's that one. I mean, and, and maybe we'll get a similar opportunity here in the next several years uh, when man hopefully lands on Mars and we'll get to witness firsthand the first time that man walks on another planet. But I just... I know a lot of you guys who are watching, you did live through this. I just must have been incredible to watch this unfold on TV. But not everyone was there to celebrate. This is what I was alluding to yesterday in the video about there being protests, about the money that was being spent on this. Wow, you've got the Vietnam War going on, and you've got the civil rights movement going on, and you've got a lot of poverty, and, and LBJ has very famously declared a war on poverty, and yet we're spending these millions on a moon mission. So uh, people, a lot of people had a problem with that. As launch preparations were made, around 150 people, mostly African-American mothers and their children, arrived at Cape Kennedy to protest the launch. They were led by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who had succeeded Dr. Martin Luther King as leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference after King's assassination the previous year. Their message was simple. It was inhuman to spend billions of dollars sending men to the moon while one in five Americans lacked proper food, shelter and health care. NASA Administrator Thomas Paine met with the protesters the evening before the launch. He told Abernathy that if we could solve the problems of poverty by not pushing the button to launch men to the moon tomorrow, then we would not push that button. Their terse meeting resolved nothing, but it ended with a handshake and a promise by Abernathy that he would pray for the safe flight of the astronauts. Hey, give both men credit. Uh, they stood for what they believed in, but also were able to find at least some amicable discussion in all of that. How things should go. The following day, 10 of the protesters were invited into the VIP stands huh. to watch the launch of Apollo 11. Okay, that's cool. Man, unbelievable. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Four days later, on the 20th of July, Armstrong and Aldrin climbed into their lunar module, call sign Eagle, and began their descent to the lunar surface. Years of hard work and training had led to this moment. The descent to the lunar surface would test their skills to the very limit. Yeah. Back on Earth, in Houston, Texas, the staff of Mission Control watched as Eagle passed behind the moon for a final time. They monitored every system in both spacecraft and guided the astronauts through the complex flight plan. And the success of the mission was about to rest on the shoulders of 26-year-old guidance officer Steve Bales. Yep. I'm getting an error message. And every one of these people that had that had monitoring stations over different areas of the mission were in a position to say go or no go for each stage of this. So when the uh, Eagle was about to land and they had this error message going, they could have said no go and the whole thing would have been aborted right there. So <laughs> no pressure 
The pressure was not just on the men in the capsule, right? The pressure's on the people on the ground, the pressure's on the flight director, the pressure's on every person who was involved in this. It took tens of thousands of people uh, doing work for years to get to this point. The master alarm sounded in the lunar module cockpit. Eagle's guidance computer was trying to tell the astronauts that something was wrong. Its simple display showed the numbers 1202, but neither Armstrong or Aldrin knew what this meant. Flight director Gene Krantz was seconds away from calling an abort. He turned to Bales for answers. 1202 meant the guidance computer was overloaded. It had too many tasks to complete in its computing cycle, and was dropping some in order to continue functioning. Without a working guidance computer, the astronauts would have to abort. But the alarm wasn't sounding continuously. Was this meant that most computational cycles were being completed properly. Bales decided that as long as the problem was only intermittent, the landing could continue. And if you watch From the Earth to the Moon, uh, which I highly recommend, they show all of this unfold. It's incredible. But then, another problem. The lunar module was approaching the surface too fast, and had overshot its intended landing site. Now, the computer was guiding them towards a massive, football stadium-sized crater, surrounded by a field of car-sized boulders. With the lunar module almost out of fuel, Armstrong took manual control. Mission control... And this is why you have Neil Armstrong in that position, right? Thing go, things go wrong, you need somebody who's cool, who's level-headed, who's willing to say, I'll take manual control. We're not landing where we thought we were. We've got to change things, and that's okay. We're getting super low on fuel. All of this pressure going on at once. Perfect guy to have in that situation. Could only watch. The landing rested on Armstrong's piloting skills. 60 seconds. Lights on. And the whole time you've got Buzz Aldrin there reading out information, telling him how many seconds of fuel he's got left, telling him what their angle is, uh, you know, just because Armstrong's got to focus on piloting this craft. And so uh, Aldrin's got to be able to give him all the information he needs to make adjustments. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Now to half. 30 seconds forward. Contact light. Contact light. That's when that dangling thing has touched. And quality base here. The Eagle has landed. That's nuts, man. That is awesome. I, I wasn't even alive for this. I was born eight years later, right? And I know this happened, what, 54 years ago now. But boy, I just still get chills watching it unfold. Oh. As around 600 million people watched from Earth, Armstrong took his first steps on the lunar surface. So there was actually several hours between when they landed and when they actually make their EVA, their, their you know, exit from the vehicle. And during that time, among other things, uh, Buzz Aldrin actually takes communion on the lunar surface. And there had been, I think it was like Apollo 8, I think it was the mission that first orbited the moon. One of the guys had read from the book of Genesis, and remember this is the time when Madeline Murray O'Hare, who's a very famous atheist, has sued the federal government, uh, and this leads to uh, removal of uh, overtly religious teaching and prayer and stuff in schools. Uh, and so now, you know, NASA being a government-funded program, she went after them for the reading of Genesis from that as well. And so they were very touchy about what, aren't, what Buzz Aldrin could and couldn't say during that part. So he actually, he did communicate back to Houston about that. And, and he basically made it as kind of general as possible. He said he just basically invited people wherever they are, wherever they were listening at home, uh, to just give thanks in his or her own way. Uh, and for Buzz Aldrin, as a Christian, what that meant for him was that he was going to give thanks for this opportunity and for all of the intelligence that had put them in this position by taking communion, which was something that was important to him and his faith. Uh, and so just kind of a cool thing that they do portray in From the Earth to the Moon. It's pretty neat. That's one small step for man. Now, according to Armstrong... The quote was, that's one small step for a man. 
one giant leap for mankind. It's not how it came across. Like he says that he did say it that way, but like there was a little cutout or something there. And so you don't hear it on the communication. It's not how it's remembered today. One giant leap for mankind. <laughs> Amazing. The precisely choreographed moonwalk had taken two years to plan. For two hours and 40 minutes, Armstrong and Aldrin gathered rock samples, set up scientific experiments, and took photographs. The wow. Apollo 11 crew returned home as heroes. And yeah, they had to sit in quarantine for a while afterwards. So that's why they're inside of there while they're talking to the president. Their names now amongst those of the greatest explorers in history. Eight. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. 100%. Now that President Kennedy's goal had been accomplished, was there any point in returning to the moon? What was left for the Apollo program to achieve? The new mission would be science. The moon's origins remained a mystery. Where did it come from? Could its scarred surface tell the story of the early solar system? And in turn, help us understand the origins of our own world? But although NASA now possessed the knowledge and technology to land on the moon, it would soon receive a powerful reminder of the dangers of spaceflight. Apollo 13. All right, well, that'll be coming tomorrow. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me for today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that again. Let me know your thoughts. Add to the conversation. Let's learn together. Amazing stuff, though. It's so amazing to watch this stuff unfold uh, and to think about what it must have been like as it happened. So let me know your thoughts. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching.